Bien, llegamos a la última conferencia de la mañana y del día. Scott Little nos va a presentar el trabajo de Turquoise Mountain, que es una fundación que, como había comentado anteriormente, está trabajando en Kabul, en Afganistán. Gracias. Gracias, Alejandro. And, um, oh, buenos días, bienvenidos. El, he olvidado todo mi castellano. Pues, um, thank you, Alejandro, and all the organizers uh, and partners for inviting Turquoise Mountain to be part of this conference. Um, now you're going to be transported to Afghanistan, so uh, quite a long way from here, quite different circumstances um, from here. So we're talking about 2006, uh, when we as a charity um, started working in Afghanistan. And already then, Afghanistan had been at war uh, for 30 years, since the late 70s. Um, and much of the built heritage and the intangible craft skills had, of course, been lost uh, in that period. It had basically, um, a whole generation had missed out, nearly two generations. So here we are um, in Kabul, uh, the old city of Kabul. Um, here we can see uh, the, Kabul, the Kabul River coming along here, the Polichishti Mosque. Um, and this, uh, an area <coughs> called Muradhani, um, which is, uh, dates to the late 18th century and is um, an area uh, constructed with traditional earth um, buildings. It was actually the first area to be settled north of the Kabul River, so uh, the, the capital started south of the river, and this area was added uh, in the last quarter uh, of the 18th century. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've done there, and then in the second half I'd like to um, think about different types or different notions of sustainability when one does this kind of restoration work um, in a place like Afghanistan. So when we arrived in this uh, area in 2006, this is what it looked like. Um, it had been completely neglected. There were very few people living there. Uh, there were a few people squatting. Uh, it had been on the front line during the Civil War in the 90s. It had become the rubbish dump of Kabul. There were these incredible um, old buildings, um, this from the mid-19th century. Uh, so one could see that it had once been a place uh, where wealthy merchants had lived. Uh, where there was architectural beauty, but they had been completely neglected. In the 90s, people were um, stealing or taking the wooden, uh, carved wooden window frames for firewood. This is another example. This is a, a, a grand sarai that was completely neglected, full of rubbish. Um, here we can see, so this is aerial satellite image of the area. So uh, we're, we're looking at this sort of um, triangle here. Uh, this is the river that we saw in the previous photo. Uh, this is taken in the mid-1980s, um, where you can see actually that the, the housing stock is still pretty much standing. Fast forward to 2005, you can see that about 50% of the stock has been um, destroyed. So there's a side-by-side -side image. You can see the difference. So 2005, the year before we started working there with the local community, uh, the area was really in a very bad state. You can see the rubbish there in the streets, up to two meters deep. Um, I am two meters tall. So the rubbish was about <laughs> this, this deep in the streets. So the first thing we did was employ everyone uh, in the wider area to just start clearing rubbish, wheelbarrows. So here we are, clearing the rubbish. In some places, it was like doing archaeology, so sort of digging down and uncovering these amazing buildings beneath. So we cleared 30,000 cubic meters of rubbish in all. The area has this very famous um, Shia shrine, which is a, a pilgrimage spot for people all over Afghanistan and beyond, called the Abul Fazl Shrine there, half obscured by rubbish. This is halfway through the work, and this is after the work. Um, so now I'll show you a, a series of before and after images of different buildings. Um, you can see the date there, um, March 2007. Um, and as we did this restoration work, it was a, a huge on-the-job vocational training scheme. So we trained over 1,100 people uh, as we did this work because these skills had been forgotten. Um, so that's before and after. Um, so you can see very dilapidated state, not very much uh, remaining at all. In many places the foundations had rotted so we had to um, 
jack up the building, replace the wood, and then put the building down again. Um, so that's before and after. So we're relearning the techniques of um, you know, the architectural woodwork, the carving, the special plaster. This is another courtyard. This was actually dating from the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, and after. This is another one where the facade was falling over. Um, this is a sarai where there was very little left indeed. The sarai is like a, a courtyard building um, often used uh, for trade uh, during the work and after. So this is actually a community uh, event that we do every year, a uh, uh, Nowruz celebration. Nowruz is the Persian New Year celebration. Um, and then we worked with the wider community, so it wasn't just the buildings, but it was the whole infrastructure. It was the streets, it was sanitation, it was electricity, all, 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 all necessary services which didn't exist in that area. Uh, this is one of the largest sarais. Um, so you can see just being used as a rubbish dump. Up here there were actually three goats living and after the work. Um, so for all that work, that took place between 2006 and 2011. Um, worked on 112 buildings in all in that triangular area, which is about a three and a half hectare site. Um, and we were awarded a uh, UNESCO award in 2013 for that work. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the physical restoration part. The thing I'd like to discuss now is sort of ideas of sustainability. So this work, at least on the physical restoration in that particular area, uh, is largely complete. Um, the question is, how do you ensure that those buildings are maintained, used, valued, appreciated for the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? Um, that's, uh, to me as a non-architect, uh, an even more interesting question. Um, so there are three th things, I think, to focus on. Um, three sort of sustainabilities. There's the sustainability of place, uh, there's the sustainability of, of process, and then there's sustainability of people. Um, so I'm going to try and flesh those ideas out a bit. Um, firstly, the place. So we work very closely with the community in this area of uh, Murad Khani, which has about 90 households, um, 550 residents. There's a commercial bazaar street uh, with about 70 uh, shopkeepers. There are no fewer than four uh, mosques and shrines in the area, two Sufi meeting places, um, and uh, other elements which I'll, I'll explain in, in a second. So the idea is to make this area live again, um, to ensure the sustainability of this as a place that people want to come to um, and either live in or shop in or visit a shrine in or go to a fortune teller or whatever. Um, so we have a primary school that we've set up uh, in the community which has 140 students, half boys, half girls. Uh, we have a family health clinic um, also in the area, uh, which again was a request that came from the community that sees um, 18,000 uh, patients every year, 70% of whom uh, are women. And then, in terms of the, what I mentioned about process, that, by that I mean really the skills that go into restoring those buildings, maintaining them, and also all sorts of associated craft skills. So it was actually mentioned yesterday evening in the, in the prize giving ceremony, the idea of, of passing, ensuring those skills are passed on to future generations. That you can regain the skills, relearn the skills, but if it, if it doesn't continue, then it's a slightly um, fruitless task. So within some of these restored historic buildings in this uh, neighborhood, we've set up an in institute, which is the National Institute for Afghan Arts and Architecture, which is a, a vocational training institution um, that teaches young Afghans. Um, all the teachers within the institute are themselves Afghan master craftsmen uh, that we had to find because there were relatively few left, and some of them are very, very um, old. Uh, one woodworker. Uh, is in his 80s now and for about 30 years was not practicing his craft because there was no local market, no links to the uh, outside world. Uh, we found him selling bananas in the bazaar, uh, but he had actually been a woodworker in the court of the last king of Afghanistan in the early 70s. Um, so we teach four crafts within the institute for three-year intensive courses. There's um, 
calligraphy and miniature painting. So miniature painting, of course, is a, uh, a distinctive tradition of, of Central Asia. We have jewelry making and gem cutting. We have woodwork, which includes carpentry, carving. This is the, um, the master craftsman I was talking about, Ustad uh, Abdul Hadi. And ceramics, so both uh, pottery making and uh, tile making. Now, I mention those because, of course, not all of those are building crafts. Some of them are other types of crafts. But this area had been a center for craft historically. So it's part of making the place live again and be sustainable is also to ensure that the crafts are sustainable and you know, give, by setting up this institute in that area, it gives an additional purpose of cultural, educational significance, which will contribute in turn to the sustainability of the place. So the sustainability of the process, i.e. the skills, and passing on those skills is also um, helping the place to flourish. Um, so we're very much interested in this idea of having the vocational skills, but then also rooting it in a location which thrives as a result. Um, and there is actually a film, which we'll see if technology happens, um, which, actually, which nicely brings together this idea of uh, sustainability of, of place, process, and people in the character of uh, another woodwork teacher, Ustad Nasa, Nasa Mansouri, and his, his story. <gasps> Uh, it's in Persian with English subtitles, I don't know. Let's see if we have Persian to Spanish translators. I don't know if you have a lot of people who are in the shop, and I don't know if you have a lot of people who are in the shop. But پس اومد ما افغانستان که 26 سال بود یه چیزی در مورد افغانستان در مورد تاریخ افغانستان در مورد گذشته افغانستان هیچ معلومات نداشتم بیشتر مثل یک خارجی یا مثل یک بیگانه بودم برای افغانستان ما وقتی که اومدم افغانستان در مو وقتام فیروزکو نو تاسیس شده بود و میخواست کار بکنه یک سری ترمیمات در یک قسمت از شهر کنه به نام مرادخونی و ما وقت آمدم و استخدام شدم به ایسی یک استاد کنننکوری به فیروزکو وقتی که من مرادخونی آمدم و در یکی از خانه قدیمی داخل شدم از روی دیوار و دروازه همو وقت میگنم که خراب بود بحثه بود و من وقتی که داخل اتاق شدم متحجب شدم که چقدر با مهارت کنننکوری شده سر چوب و و چه با چه زرافت و چه تناسب من دمو وقت شاید اینطوری ندید بودم کنننکوری وقتی که من امو خانه را و امو آثار را که در داخل از بور دیدم متوجه شدم که فهمیدم که افغانستان واقعا چی گذشته داشته تاریخ داشته تمدن داشته و از نظر هنری خیلی قوی بوده و من فهمیدم که ما یک چیزی داشتیم قبلا که باید ادامه بودم میره و ایره پیش برمش ساخت یک چیزی دستی سنتی افغانی میتونه یک چهره دیگه افغانستان رو معرفی کنه به یک تدا آمای که از بیرون میبینن افغانستان رو یعنی افغان ها میتونن یک سری چیزهای رو بسازن هم رای دست زندگی در افغانستان واقعا سخت است ولی من وقتی که کار میکنم واقعا میرم در یک دنیای دیگه So um, that's Ustad Nasa, and, and, and there are dozens of other artisans like him that we work with, which, I mean, they are the only reason uh, the project works and, and has a life. Um, and it's because he feels rooted in, in Kabul, even though he grew up as a refugee in Iran, just as millions of other Afghans grew up either as refugees in Iran or Pakistan or beyond. Um, but he has this connection now to the place and, and to its craft, which ensures also the sustainability of what we're doing, because, I mean, I'm not planning on living in Afghanistan for the rest of my life. My other <laughs> foreign colleagues um, aren't. So the, these things only work when there's full um, local ownership and, and, and it will continue for decades into the future. 
Um, so the third part, we mentioned um, the sustainability of, of the place and of the, the skills, the process, so passing those on. And then we have the people. So people like NASA and people also like Samira Kitman, who graduated from our institute from the calligraphy department. And what we do when people graduate is to um, work with them to help them set up businesses or to join existing businesses so that there is an economic viability to what they're doing because all of these crafts we agree are um, very beautiful, handmade things are beautiful, um, but if no one wants to buy them then no one is going to continue uh, practicing those crafts. So we, and given the local market is difficult, Afghanistan has 40% unemployment, um, we look at export. So people like Samira who graduated, then she set up her own calligraphy business called uh, Muftai Honar, which means the key of art. Uh, and she produces calligraphic pieces like these, we call them shamsas, so illumination work with uh, an inscription in the middle, a Quranic inscription perhaps, or something from uh, Persian poetry as decorative wall art. And two years ago, we helped her to win a contract uh, at this hotel, which is actually I mean, not a very beautiful hotel, but it's a five-star hotel in, uh, in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Um, and actually, when it's complete, it will be, I think, the largest hotel in the world. This is phase one. Um, and so we secured a $650,000 contract on behalf of six different Afghan businesses, including Samira's business. So she produced $100,000 worth of these pieces, um, employing 30, 30 women in the process which now hang on the walls of the uh, VIP suites in this hotel in, uh, in Mecca. This is one of her, her um, employees who also graduated from the institute. And in, across the crafts, this is what we're doing. We're helping artisans to link to international markets so that this third element of sustainability, the people part, which is the most important part, um, really works and flourishes, i.e. people can earn an income from what they do improve their livelihoods, improve the condition um, of their family. So these are the traditional ceramics with this uh, traditional turquoise glaze. Uh, this is a wood commission for a five-star hotel in London, the Connaught Hotel, so all of the furniture was produced in Afghanistan. This is another commission for a townhouse in upstate uh, New York where um, the latticework screens are being made uh, in Kabul and so on and so forth, right across the different product lines, tiles, glassware, furniture, jewellery. Those were launched at Paris Fashion Week. And then um, the last element, which uh, is it's important to have the consciousness of the value of this heritage, both built and intangible in Afghanistan, so that people value it and protect it and continue to transmit it. But internationally, so that people become interested in these products, buy them, um, we also want to change perceptions about Afghanistan. So I don't know what your thoughts were as you watched that film, whether that was whether you were surprised or whether you knew Afghanistan had those traditions or whether you thought the place was a complete war zone and only has people shooting each other, Taliban, corruption, chaos. But this is, this is what we want to do along with our art stance, is show people this unexpected side, surprise people, show them the beauty, show them the resilience, show them the creativity. So we do this through large-scale international exhibitions. This one in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha in 2013. This was one of the pieces in there, um, created by Humaira. And currently um, in Washington, DC, at the Freya Sackler Galleries of the Smithsonian. So you can see here we've actually recreated um, a traditional Afghan uh, pavilion in the exhibition space. Uh, so we, you can learn about pottery, uh, you can learn about Afghan carpets, um, you can look at the lattice work technique being used in uh, innovative new designs. Here's uh, an Afghan music evening taking place in the exhibition space. Um, and then lastly, uh, I mentioned uh, the consciousness of, of, of this heritage in Afghanistan. Of course, the Afghan government, Afghans in general, have arguably many other priorities aside from the protection of cultural heritage and of their buildings. Um, many more pressing issues. Um, the Taliban <laughs> controls uh, a third of the country currently. Um, but what we can hope to do is by raising awareness that future generations 
um, will have a greater sense of, of the importance of this heritage. So this is um, a character from Afghan Sesame Street who uh, is a, a, a special Afghan addition to the normal Sesame Street characters called Zari. Um, so Zari has now visited us uh, three times in the old city to film episodes. Um, and we're going to see now another film which will show um, children actually from the primary school we support uh, appearing in the historic buildings of the old city. And um, the words of the song are in Persian, but they talk about, they're talking about different uh, traditional dress from different parts of Afghanistan and how um, even though uh, they're different, they're all Afghan. Um, but it, to me, encapsulates really um, the last part of that sustainability argument, which is that unless you have that consciousness and future generations uh, care, then these interventions will only ever be temporary. Um, so I don't know if we can manage to see that film. بسیار مقبول است. کاکا اجمل کالای من چطور است؟ آه بسیار مقبول است. زری جان کی برای تو ماده ساخته؟ ایرا مادرم برام طرح کرده و دوخته. Um, so the um, right we are from Afghanistan, we are from Afghanistan. Um, and actually the interesting thing to note is that is that um, that was not actually a film made by us, so that was actually made by uh, an Af private Afghan TV station called Tolo TV which is the largest channel in Afghanistan. Um, so they just came in and produced that as part of the Sesame Street, uh, Afghan Sesame Street that is watched by a million people um, every week. So that's, that's sort of the future of what we're doing, is that that just becomes normal and something that people want to promote and value and um, show off. Um, so yeah, that's enough for me. Thank you.